My own? My own. All right. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to be in the Lord's house. Amen. Let's hear a word from God. In the book of Psalm, chapter 119, starting to read at verse 71, it is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of coins of gold and silver. Your hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. And one of the reasons that we have gathered together in this place this morning is so that we can hopefully do the very thing that the psalmist asked the Lord to do for him. Let me, let me hear your commandments. Give me understanding of those commandments. And my friend, the Bible bears record that the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Amen. And I can use all the wisdom that God will give me. Amen. I don't think about myself either. Amen. Isn't it good to be in the Lord's house? Amen. Amen. Well, I'm going to make an announcement right fast for the benefit. I see that we've still got a red light going over here, so I'm going to, I'm going to make an announcement for the benefit of those that may be viewing us by Facebook. Uh, we've had some technical problems here at the church. We do not have any phone service. We do not have any internet service here at the church, which greatly impacts our ability to be able to broadcast our services. But we've got a makeshift band-aid going right now. We don't know how long it's going to stay on. So I want to say that in the event that it doesn't go all the way through the service, you forgive us for that. There's nothing we can do. This is, boy, it may mean for a week. This is Midway Baptist Church in Athens, Alabama. And I'm Jerome Hilliard. If you don't know it, I'm your pastor. Have <laughs> been for 25 years. Amen. And it's been a blessing to me, I promise you. I promise you. And I want to thank you, church, for uh, the recognition that you gave Linda and I last Sunday and for the gifts, for the cards, for the well wishes. And I assure you, Linda hadn't seen the envelope yet. <laughs> Let's go to the Lord in the word of prayer. All right, Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity that we have to be in your house. Lord, and I just pray that for the next little while that everything that's done in this place will be for your glory and for your honor. I pray, Father, that if there's one viewing or one sitting in this sanctuary this morning that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Savior, that the Holy Spirit of conviction will fall upon them in such a mighty way that they will come to this altar or even where they are sitting, they would ask Jesus Christ into their life. Father, I pray for those that uh, are Christians that need encouragement. May a word of encouragement come forth this morning for them. For those that need to be built up, Lord, that something be said that will build them up in their faith. Lord, we just want your will to be done today. We pray, Father, that we'll give you glory and honor and power for everything that we do. We say today, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Brother Jim. Well, good morning. Good morning. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Amen. Can't let this technical stuff get us down, can we? You know, we got some other technical stuff we grew up without. That's right. Air conditioning, padded pews, yeah. all that kind of stuff. You know, we're going to brown bitches if you sit on We call them pews. But you better be careful wasn't a fat person sitting on the other end. You got to say, you might get pinched. <laughs> some of you young and you little whippers down there don't know what we're talking about here. But uh, man, some good services. We still can have those good services today. An old song that I remember singing back in those days. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. <laughs> Turn to page 446 in the Baptist hymnal. We'll sing all three stanzas. <laughs>
Pastor's wife Linda is going to come and sing this morning. All the children and youth going to Children's Church, and I guess called a youth church. Uh, meet in the back. Come on, Linda. to be able to say to you this morning that <clears throat> I know where I'm going to be a hundred years from now. Amen. And it's because I've been found. Amen. <clears throat> you see, some 2,000 years ago, there was one sent from God. His name was Jesus. And he was the only begotten Son of God. And that Jesus said this, they that are sick, or they that are holy, not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous to repentance, but the lost. Amen. And I am one of those that was lost. And just as Jesus said that uh, he had come to seek and to save that which was lost, I'm glad he saved me. Amen. He found me in my lost condition and he saved me. And by doing so, I'm guaranteed where I'm going to be 100 years from now. Uh, more than likely, I'm going to be there a lot sooner than a hundred years from now. <laughs> but I'm glad to know where I'm going. Uh, we were studying this morning. I'm going to say all of this, and then I'll get to the message. All right. 
We were studying this morning from the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 12. And uh, I told Brother Jim, Brother Jim and Patsy are gone, so I can go ahead and talk about it now. <laughs> I told Brother Jim I was uh, viewing the Sunday school lesson and I had uploaded it to YouTube for folks to see this morning that couldn't make it to church, the Sunday school class. Uh, so I uploaded it. And I told Brother Jim after viewing it, I, I said, Brother Jim, that was truly a blessing to me. Uh, I want to try to make a way that you can present that to the entire church. It come from Ecclesiastes chapter 12. And these are the words of a man that had uh, started off in his young years praying and asking God to give him wisdom. And God gave him wisdom. His name was Solomon. God gave him wisdom above any man that had, that had, that had preceded him and wisdom above any man that came after him, say for Jesus Christ. And as things would go, he allowed the satanic influences to draw him down. Solomon did. And here in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, he sort of summoned things up. And you can, as you read it, you can almost hear his words and almost see a man that has, that has just drained of the joy of life because of the bad decisions that he made. But he does go on to say, let me tell you, the conclusion of the whole matter is to fear God and keep his commandments. Well, I heard Brother Jim teach that. I read it. And uh, we were going to uh, my 55th class, high school class reunion last night. And there was like five or six other grades there with us. They had asked me to pray the invocation. And they usually do it with class reunions. And I usually get up and I'll pray the invocation. And then I'll sit down. But last night I just felt impressed by the Lord to give them a sermonette. <laughs> and so I did and uh, after after we had done all that we were going to do and we were mingling around getting ready to go had several folks to come up to me and say they appreciate the words that I said and I said well just give God glory and honor if there's any honor to be given any glory give it to God I just did what I felt the Lord would have me to do. But on the way home, Linda and I were talking about how old they look. <laughs> Got home and looked in the mirror and said, oh my. <laughs> Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me this morning to the book of Mark, chapter 14. Mark 14. Someone might say, well, you going to quit reading from that. When I get through this series, <laughs> Mark 14, I'm not going to read the entire verses or the entire set of verses that I've been reading, but just a few of them to sort of refresh us. I hope that by now uh, it doesn't take a whole lot to refresh our memory about what is being said here. But we're going to be reading in uh, Mark chapter 14, and I'm going to pick up reading at verse 3. Mark 14, verse 3. And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman having an alabaster flask, a very costly oil of spikenard, then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. But there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always. And whenever you wish, you may do them good. But me, you do not have always. She has done what she could. Let's read that again. She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, 
what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. And here we are, some nearly 2,000 years later, and that scripture is being fulfilled in your very presence. What she did is being shared, and it's a memorial to her. Bow with me for another moment of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, I come before you once again. Lord, I just want to ask that you be with us in this time of sharing your word. Father, I don't know what the needs of each and every person in the sanctuary is. I don't know what the needs of those are that are watching. Well, Lord, sometimes I don't even know what my needs are. But I know that you know. And Lord, I pray today that we will be ears open, minds receptive, heart receptive to what you say to us today from your word that our needs may be met. Lord, I ask that you give the recall of this message and the leadership of it. The recall of your word and the leadership of it, that in everything that's said and done, you'll be magnified, glorified, and honored. And I'll give you the praise for it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. For she has done what she could. This series of messages has been entitled, Have You Done What You Could? Have You Done What You Could? And I shared with you at the very onset that we were going to look at that in uh, four respects. You might say five. Number one, have you done what you could to be saved? That's the most important thing that you can do in life, my friend, Amen. is to be saved. Amen. One of my classmates last night got himself into a whole heap of trouble as he was talking before all of us. And he said, the best thing that ever happened to me he started to say his wife, and he said, no. Nope. He said, the best thing that ever happened to me was accepting Jesus Christ as my Savior. Amen. And then he right hurriedly said, and the second best thing was my wife. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say that the greatest thing that can happen for any of us is to accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. Amen. And then I shared with you that uh, we need to ask ourselves our, this question. Well, what have we done? Have we done all that we could to increase our faith? And that's what I'm going to deal with this morning, the second part of that, really. Last Sunday, I shared with you the first part of what have you done to increase your faith. This morning, we're going to look further, but let's just refresh ourselves just a little bit. You know, this is a very interesting story. This is the story of a woman that brings a... A container of oil that is worth a common man's entire annual wages. And she breaks open the container and she pours that oil upon Jesus. Well, while she's doing this, the disciples, it's sad to say the disciples, but that's the truth. It does, the scripture doesn't say that it was those that did not accept Christ as Savior. Scripture says it was his disciples. They began criticizing her. As a matter of fact, they became indignant. They were angry that such a costly thing could have been taken and sold and given to the poor. And Jesus rebukes them sharply. He says, let her alone. Just a little side note, my friend, if Jesus ever rebukes you and says, let it alone, you know what you need to do? Let it alone. Right. <clears throat> you know, if Jesus in the word of God tells us not to do something, we should not think that we've got the liberty to do it. Amen. We should leave it alone. Jesus goes on to say, what she has done is to anoint my body for burial. Now, here's something that's interesting about this. This has been a revelation to me this week. I hadn't shared this point with you in times past. What's interesting to me is that the scripture doesn't tell us that this woman knew why she was doing it. You see, if you were to go back in the scripture in the book of Mark, 
in the book of Mark three times up to the point where we're at. Three times Jesus has shared that he was going to be crucified, killed, buried, and then he'd rise again. Three times. As I studied the three instances of him sharing that, there's no indication to me, and I, I must confess, that there's no indication that she wasn't in his presence when he made that proclamation. But as far as the scripture coming out and saying, she did this because she fully understood what was going to happen. The scripture doesn't say that. You say, well, why is that important? Well, here's why it's important is because there are things that we are prompted to do by the Spirit of God, by the Word of God, that we may not understand the fullness of it, but we should do it. Right. Right. I'll use myself as a prime example. I, I was going to tell my classmates last night, but the Lord didn't let me do it. I was going to tell my classmates last night that, you know, uh, I, had, I had been in the ministry for 46 years. And for those of my classmates that had found that hard to believe that I was a Christian, that I was a minister, that I was a pastor, for those that didn't know that, they could get over that in about two years if they just accepted it. <laughs> I'll be honest with you, I go back to when God was dealing with my heart about sharing the word of God, about being called into the ministry. I did not want to accept that. And the reason why I did not want to accept it is because I did not understand it. I didn't understand why God would choose someone like me to do such a very important thing. And Linda will tell you, I believe if she's honest, at least she tells me, that's been, that was some of the darkest days in our entire marriage while I was running from God's call. It was miserable. But it wasn't until I submitted myself to what it was God wanted me to do, even though I didn't fully understand it, did I find the joy that I had found in being in a pulpit. Amen. Now you might hear some folks say that they don't enjoy preaching. I enjoy preaching. I, do. I don't enjoy some of the things I have to say, but I still have to say it. Amen. Three of you agree with me. <laughs> All right. Anyway, this woman did not, according to Scripture, she did not know what she was doing, but there was an unction upon her to do it, and she did it. And after she did it, Jesus said, she did it for my burial. What an amazing story. An amazing story. To be prompted by the Holy Spirit to do something, even when you don't understand it, even when you don't know all the details, of it, you just do it. You just do it. In a, in, in a little while, I'm going to be sharing with you that we are passing out our nominating forms, uh, our survey to request of you what it is that you can do in the service of the Lord these next two church years. And my friend, I don't want you to say to yourself, I don't understand why God would want me to do something like this, but I feel the unction to do it, and so I'm going to do it. Amen. I look to get free. <laughs> All right, let's go on here. Okay. So last Sunday, I brought you to this point about faith, and I asked you, what have you done to build up your faith? And someone might say, well, how do you get faith tied in to what this woman did? Well, I hope in some form, some fashion, I might have given you a pretty good hint that it was faith that moved this woman to do what she did. Yeah, amen. Uh, folks, faith. Faith is such a necessity it's such a it's such a need for all of us to have faith and to do what we can to make that faith stronger Amen. to make that faith stronger 
I, I want to share with you just uh, right hurriedly, I want to share with you uh, some, some insights into faith. I want you to look at Mark chapter 11 with me. Mark chapter 11 and verse 22, it says, So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. Why do I need to be concerned about this thing called faith? Well, if I didn't have any other reason to be concerned about it, it's because Jesus said to have it. <laughs> Jesus says, have <clears throat> faith in God. Now, I want you to hear something. Uh, I had just thoroughly enjoyed this finds expository Bible that I've been preaching from, from now for about two, two and a half years. And uh, Dr. Jerry Vines, good Baptist preacher, good Baptist preacher, he says something that, uh, that at first I thought, boy, that's harsh, but it's true. And listen to what he says. He says this, you, have no right whatsoever to run your life. You have no right whatsoever to run your life. You belong to God. The human spirit has been implanted there by God. And your responsibility is to respond to him. God is interested not in taking from you, but in redeeming you, changing you, and making your life what it ought to be. Have you rendered unto God that which is his? The only way we can do that is by faith. Because surely there'll be some that says, well, you know, I'm an independent person. You know, I've I, I got to understand why things are before I act upon them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then I hear the words of Dr. Jerry Bynes, you have no right whatsoever to run your own life. I'm going to say amen. I must say amen. Scripture says in the book of Ecclesiastes that when I die, my body goes back to the dust from which it came, but my spirit goes back to God from which it came or who gave it. Oh, that's interesting. I want you to hear something else that he says about this thing of faith. If you will indulge me just for a moment, let me... Let me share this with you. Mark chapter 4 and uh, verse, I think I meant 430, no, 40. Uh, and this comes from the story of Jesus speaking to the wind and the waves and telling them to be peaceful. Okay, the disciples were frightened because of the winds and the waves. And Jesus spoke to them and uh, they heard him. You know, the disciples even said uh, down in verse 41 of Mark chapter four, they said, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? I want you to listen to what Jesus said prior to them saying what they said. This is in verse 40. But he said to them, Jesus said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? How is it that you have no faith? Now, listen to what Dr. Jeremiah says. Notice that Jesus put two things in opposition. Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? These two realities, fear 
in faith cannot exist in the human heart at the same time. They are mutually exclusive. Fear is looking at the storm. Faith is looking at the Savior. Fear is looking at the circumstance. Faith is looking to God. The disciples were afraid in the storm. They had heard Jesus' words and had seen him perform miracles, great demonstrations of his power. Yet in the midst of this crisis, they allowed fear to take over. They had no need to be afraid because Jesus had given them his word. Before I share with you the last part of this uh, little commentary that he makes, I'm going to say this. Every one of us have either been in a storm or we are in a storm or we are coming out of a storm. Amen. You see, you don't go through this life. Young person, you may think that, you know, this is just an old white-headed man saying something. I want you to understand, I'm being truthful with you. Storms are going to come. Amen. You need faith. I need faith. We all need faith to bear through those storms. Amen. Now listen to this. I continue. Faith is taking Jesus at his word. Just reading the Bible is not enough. We must claim the promise of the word of God and make them your own. Listen, when you go to that doctor's appointment tomorrow, take him at his word. When you face that personal sorrow in your family, take him at his word. Faith is taking God at his word. You don't have to be afraid when Jesus is on board. Amen. You see, my friend, the necessity of building our faith. We need to do all that we can to increase our faith. Amen. Too many Christians are living with the faith of a grain of mustard seed. Oh, I know that Jesus said those words that if you got at least that much faith, you'd do great things. Just think how much you can do for God and in God's service and in your own personal life if your faith was bigger than a grain of mustard seed. A grain of mustard seed can move mountains. What could happen if you got more than a grain of mustard seed? Listen to what faith does for you and for me. Faith, the importance of it. Well, I couldn't be saved without it. Could not be saved. And I'll go back to my statement I made earlier that the most important thing in my life was being saved. Amen. Knowing Jesus Christ is my personal Savior was the most important decision that I've ever made in my life. Amen. And it will remain the most important decision that I have made in my life. For you see, it is that decision that decides where I'm going to be a hundred years from now. Amen. And to all that would accept Christ as their Savior, they've got the promise of a better place that they'll be a hundred years from now. Amen. The scripture said he came into his own, his own received him not, but to them that received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on the name of Jesus Christ. It takes faith, for the scripture says, someone says, well, you know, I don't know if I totally agree with that. Well, if you don't, you don't agree with the Bible. Well, the Bible said in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, 4, by grace are you saved Amen. through faith, that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of your works, lest any man should boast. Amen. Titus 3, 5 says, not by works of righteousness which we've done, but according to his mercy, he hath saved us. And that occurs through our faith. What is faith? 
Oh, I can quote you Hebrews 11, 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But what does that really mean? You've heard me say it many times before. The country boy's explanation of that is taking God at his word and acting upon it. Yeah. Let me give you a one word definition of faith. And I believe you'll understand this one word. Trust. Amen. Trust. <laughs> we all know what it means to trust somebody. Oh, I have found out that one of the joys of being married longer, I know she ain't go like this, but of her getting older, <laughs> is her ability to cook. <laughs> yes, sir. She and I have got this little thing that we do. It may not be the best thing we all do, but we do it anyway, is that we will get our little dinner trays and we will pop down right in front of the TV and watch the news. <laughs> and we will eat. Well, since I don't cook, I, I think I've done my duty when I go get the trays and set them up. <laughs> <laughs> And I'll set my tray up and I'll sit down right where I'm going to eat. And directly, here she'll come. Oh, it's mighty fine. But you know what? For every bite that I take, there has to be trust. I don't believe she's put arsenic in it. <laughs> I don't believe she's doused it with something that's going to kill me. You see how simple trust really is? When somebody says that they will do something, you believe it. You accept it. I've heard this expression all my life. Trust is, hearing it said, it's as good as done. It's going to happen. Jesus says, trust me. Trust me. What are you going to trust him with? I'm going to trust him with my salvation. I'm going to trust him to keep me saved. Amen. I'm going to trust him that when I come to death's chilly waters, that he's going to be with me and carry me to the other side. Amen. I'm going to trust him that he's going to carry me to that place where there be no more pain, no more suffering, there be no more sorrow, there be no more death. I'm going to trust him to do that. And I'm going to trust him that one day in the future that there's going to be a loud trumpet to sound and Jesus is going to mount up upon his cloud and he's going to bring me with him and he's going to give me a glorified body fashioned just like his body. Amen. I'm going to trust him that he's then going to carry me back to glory and I'm going to stay there for some seven years and then he's going to put me on a white stag and I don't like horses, but I'm sure I'm going to like that one. He's going to put me on a white stag and we are coming back to this earth and all of the armies of Satan are going to be defeated. I'm going to trust him. I'm going to trust him that when he said, and behold, I'll make all things new, that the heavens and the earth shall pass away and he'll make them new. I'm going to trust him. You see how simple it is? That's all the Lord asked us to do is to trust him. Believe him. Have faith in him. So I'm saved by it. And listen, let me tell you. I think this about tough. Well, I'm in a hurry. Uh, I think about this every time I read the last chapter of the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon, Solomon, and, and God knows my heart. I know. God, God knows my heart. I'm not, I am not judging Solomon. None whatsoever. But when I read the last chapter of the book of Ecclesiastes, I almost picture in my mind's eye a silent person. Someone that has just wasted his life away. He knows the truth. He knows what he ought to have done. And for whatever the reasons are, he hasn't done it. Now, I am thankful that he's imparting that wisdom to us 
when he says, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. I appreciate it when he's rendering unto us wisdom that we ought to fear God and that we ought to keep his commandments, that that's our whole deal. I appreciate that. And, and I do, but I see a man that has grown disenchanted with life when I read the words of Solomon. Now, you may not agree with me, and that's all right. I've been wrong before. You have to. But, <laughs> but that's what I see when I see. And here's the reason why I say that. Jesus said, I've come that you might have joy. I've come that you might have joy. Jesus said, these things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. He wasn't talking about when they died. He was talking about while they were living. Amen. Jesus said in John chapter 10, he said, I've come that you might have life, that you might have it more abundantly. Amen. Uh, friend, Listen, uh, if you're bitter all the time, if you can't find things to be happy about, if you can't find things to smile about, if you can't find things to be happy about, you need to increase your faith. I need to increase my faith. And you know what the truth of it is? The truth of it is, I believe that we all go through periods of time like that. And this is why faith is so important. For the Bible said in Hebrews 11, 6, but without faith it is impossible. Please God, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. He's not talking about just when you die and go to heaven. He's talking about in the now. I, 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 I remember, hey, listen. I remember being young. Not everything, but I do remember being young. And one of the things I remember about being young were sour looking Christians, especially the older ones. And I'll be honest with you, the thought did cross my mind if that's what it means to be a Christian, I don't need that. You see the wrong impressions that we exude towards others? There's some truth in if you're happy, notify your face. It's joy unspeakable and full of glory, not just when I die, but while I'm alive. My daughter, she learned me well. I didn't have to say anything. And she'd look at me and she'd say, well, fine. I can be talking to her on the phone. And she can say to me, what's wrong with you? <laughs> you see, our persona emulates from us. And folks can detect joy, happiness, sorrow, gloom, and doom. It takes faith to go through this life Trust in God. We please God. You know, the Bible says we live by it. Romans 1 16 says, There in his righteousness, God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. It did not say the just might live by faith. It didn't say the just can hope to live by faith. It said the just will live by faith. We have peace by it. Romans 5, 1 says, Therefore, being justified by God, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 4, 7 says, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. How can someone that's got the peace of God and have uh, the Lord Jesus protecting our hearts and our minds, not be happy, not be joyful. I'm sure it could be done. I just don't understand. 
2 Timothy 4, 17 says we're strengthened by it. I give you this and I'm going to close for this morning. We're commanded to have faith. Believe that? Amen. If you've listened to what I have read from God's holy word this morning, you'll know that to be true. Now, we are as effective in our Christian walk to the degree of the strength of what we put our faith in. Jimmy Harrison used to say it like this. He was a mentor of mine. He'd say, you're no stronger than the object of your faith. You are no stronger than the object of your faith. Ooh, look what an object we got of our faith. Jesus Christ. <laughs> no wonder Paul said, I can do all things through Christ which strengthened me. How strong is your faith? Next Sunday, I'm going to tell you how to strengthen it. How to strengthen your faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you this morning for the opportunity you've given me to share a message from your word. And I just pray, Father, that what's been said this morning has magnified, glorified, and honored you. And I just pray today, Father, that it's been of, it's been of a help. It's ministered to the hearts of these that are in this sanctuary, those that have been watching. Lord, even myself, Lord, thank you your word. Thank you, Lord, for the promises of your word. We know that faith is important. It's a necessity. And we know, Father, that we can have faith in you. Thank you, Lord, for it. If there's one in our midst that needs to put faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior today by accepting him as their Savior, I pray that they would come to this altar while we give this hymn of invitation. And if there's one father that needs to recommit, rededicate their life, I pray they would come. If there's one that you're leading to join this church in the manner in which we receive members, I pray, Father, that they come as well. Bless those that have viewed. Lord, I pray the same blessings upon them that we ask for ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. Let's sing hymn number 424 in the Baptist hymnal. Number 424 in the Baptist Hymn.